And uh, today the theme is, what does the Bible teach about spiritual warfare? Now it's very important, um, it's very important that we understand what the Bible teaches about different teachings because there are so many teachings that people follow uh, people's thinking. Uh, you know, about spiritual warfare, there are ideas that people follow instead of following the Bible. So today I will talk about spiritual warfare from the Bible and then uh, so it's, it's important that we examine all our teachings, all our beliefs, whether they come from the Bible or come from human being. You know, even if famous preachers, you know, sometimes some famous preachers, they, they preach about things uh, that might not be in the Bible. For instance, uh, pre-tribulation rapture. Many preachers talk about that, but actually it's not found in the Bible. It's, it, it's sad to see that. It's not in the Bible, but many, many preachers preach about that without examining the Bible, without examining what the Bible say about the time of the rapture. Now, that's not my theme today. My theme is, what does the Bible teach about spiritual warfare? We're going to go to the Bible verses. So this is about what the Bible teaches about uh, spiritual warfare. Now, first thing the Bible teaches is that Jesus has victory over Satan already. God already has victory over Satan. Satan has no power over God at all. Now, when Christians are weak, Satan can attack Christians who are weak, who are uh, sinning without repentance. Then Satan can attack them. But uh, God himself has total victory over, um, over Satan. Now, there are some people, <clears throat> there are some people who say that, you know, God is fighting a war he has already fought the war. And what God is doing now is trying to keep Christians loving Him. He works on Christians. When Christians love God and have a good relationship with God and follow God and obey Him and serve Him, God will take care of them. Satan has no way to attack them. So it's very, uh, so it's very important that we understand that Jesus has victory over Satan already. Okay, the first Bible verses, Matthew 12, 28. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? So let's look at a verse here. Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has already come. And then, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man? So the strong man here is Satan. How can Jesus enter Satan's house and plunder his goods and cast out demons, unless he has bound the strong man, that he has bound Satan. So what, is, uh, what it tells us is that Jesus has already had victory over Satan. Actually, Jesus has victory over Satan in all eternity. Now here, the timing, the time here is before his crucifixion. Because his crucifixion has effect in the Old Testament and New Testament. So even in the Old Testament, the people of God can drive out demons. And so here before Jesus' crucifixion, the effect of His death on the cross that takes away all the accusation uh, on God's people has been taken away. Now even before that time, even in Old Testament, that uh, uh, the book of Hebrews says that, uh, you know, the, that that it says that the the uh, the ram, the the lamb and the and the ox they offer cannot cleanse their sins. It's only 
Jesus who cleansed the sins is Christ who has cleansed the sins of the people in the first covenant, which is the Old Testament and the Old Te and the New Testament. So it's God Himself. <clears throat> he already has victory, and it's only Jesus who can give us victory. It's Jesus' sacrifice for sin make the people in the Old Testament uh, give them salvation. The the ox and the lamb are only are only a, a f figure of the offering of Jesus Christ. The ox and the lamb cannot take away the sins. It's Jesus Christ who can take away the sins. So we understand this and then we know that that even in the Old Testament the fact that God can forgive people because Jesus dying on the cross brought salvation to them. Now we can talk about that some other time about this teaching. But the point is that before Jesus died, he can he could already forgive people and he could already drive out demons. So he has already had victory over Satan. Actually in all eternity God has always had victory over Satan. It's by the death of Jesus that God has given us the victory over Satan. But this victory is not given after Jesus' death. It's actually before that. Jesus said to the disciples already that I've given you authority to trample on the snakes and scorpions. That he has already given them the authority. And the disciples could drive out demons. So Jesus has this authority all the time. God has all this authority all the time to overcome the power of Satan. That Satan has no say in his in God's kingdom at all. It's only when people sin then Satan can attack them. So Jesus has already defeated and bound Satan. He does not need to continue to fight Satan. He continues to build up our spiritual life. He doesn't have to fight Satan all the time because Satan is already under his feet. Satan is under his God's feet for eternity. He has always defeated Satan. But for the sake of the people, Jesus has to pay the price so that all his people can be free from sins and the accusation of Satan. Okay, so we must understand this that Jesus has already bound the uh, the strong man, Satan. So nobody can, uh, you know, Jesus and God doesn't have to continue to fight because in one of the assignments I saw that one pastor wrote that uh, God is uh, fighting for us. That Jesus doesn't have to fight. He already has the victory. It's just Jesus needs to help us to follow Him and love Him and obey Him so that we'll be blessed by God. You know, God is all the blessings. It's just whether the people trust in God and obey Him and, and follow Him. When we all follow God wholeheartedly, then Satan has no power over us at all. So that's very important to understand that Jesus has already had victory and Christians can claim this victory of Jesus. Okay, and then Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus has already given us authority. This is given, this was given to the disciples before his crucifixion. So Jesus has already had the victory over Satan before he died on the cross. But it's dying on the cross that you know that give Satan the deadly blow that he cannot attack Christians anymore. But this effect that Satan cannot attack his people, it's effective in the Old and New Testament. The effect of Jesus' death on the cross was effective in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. That, that uh, all the God's people, when they trust in God for forgiveness, in, even in Old Testament, they can be forgiven. And in, in the New Testament, they, uh, that we that the uh, people of God were forgiven before Jesus died on the cross. And also this authority over Satan was given to his people before Jesus' death. But the effect 
came from Jesus' death on the cross, that Satan cannot attack his people anymore. So Jesus has given us authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. This is talking about uh, the demons and over all the power of the, the enemy. All the power of the enemy cannot prevail against us and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now it's very important to understand this. <coughs> nothing can hurt us. Satan cannot do anything to hurt us. Now there are many Christians who are afraid, who are afraid that you know Satan can attack them. That there are many Christians who fear that they, uh, when they have a fever, when they have uh, family problems, when they have problems in the church, problems in the ministry, they will say, "Oh, I'm under attack." They always say, "I'm under attack." They don't have to say that. They, they examine their own sins and the sins of the people. When they have to fight in the family, do they have sins? Do they fight against the family members? Do they love the family members? The cause of the problems in the family is because of their sins that they don't love the family members. And the problems in the church is because the people don't love God and don't, uh, you know, they don't have peace and harmony. But when we guide the people to love God and honor God and have harmony, then there is no more fight in the church. But then many people will say, oh, Satan is attacking me. Now, if a person has sinned, Satan can attack them. So the cause is uh, our sins, not Satan, not that Satan has authority to attack us. Satan has no authority authority to attack us. So we don't need to say Satan is attacking us. We need to say, yes, I have sinned and I've give, given Satan a foothold. So we, we don't need to say that. The cause is not Satan's attack. The cause is our sins. When we sin, then we give the devil a foothold for him to attack us. So it's very important that we understand that, that we uh, Understand that only our sins will give the devil a foothold. So Jesus said, has already given us authority to trample on Satan and nothing can hurt us. So if we love God and obey God, nothing can hurt us. Now some people say, well, how can we be perfect? Even when we are not perfect, we just confess our sins. Lord Jesus, I have sinned. Please forgive me. Then Satan cannot attack us. Because Jesus has forgiven us, then Satan cannot attack us. So it's very important to understand that Satan cannot attack us when we confess our sins and when we obey God. Now, if a person purposely sin, intentionally sin, then he can give Satan a, a foothold. Uh, that if a person, you know, continue to have adultery and then he asks God to forgive him, that he is not sincere in his repentance. But when we are sincerely repenting, then Satan has no way to attack us. So I hope we all understand that. We don't have to fear Satan at all. And then how Satan attacks. Jesus can give us abundant life. And Jesus wants to give us abundant life. And Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. When we love and obey God, Satan can't steal from us. So, Jesus wants to give us abundant life. Jesus doesn't say, well, if Satan doesn't attack you, then I'll give you abundant life. Jesus said, I came to give you, I've come to give you eternal life, abundant life. I want to give you abundant life. Satan cannot steal that from you. So, Jesus did not say that unless if Satan stopped attacking you. So Jesus is not afraid of the attack of Satan and we don't have to be afraid of the attack of Satan. And we should be careful about sins. We understand that it's sins that give the devil a foothold. But there are many people, they just say, oh, today I have a fever, it's, I'm attacked again. So they blame every problem they have on the attack of Satan. Now, physical sickness, we cannot say that it comes from 
uh, our sins, you know, unless if it's us who don't take care of our own health. It's important that we take care of our health. Our health is very important. Even if we love God and pray a lot and are very faithful in loving our family and, and uh, serving God, if we don't take care of our health, then we can lose our health and then we can lose everything. So it's very important that we take care of our relationship with God and our family relationship, our relationship with people, and then our health, our physical health and spiritual health, that we take care of this so that uh, we don't get sick easily. And then if we love God and follow God, then Satan cannot steal from us. It's very important that we believe that Satan has no power over us. Nothing can hurt us. So the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come that we might have life and that we will, will have it abundantly, that we'll have abundant life. That Jesus wants us to have abundant life, that we live fully. So Jesus give, wants to give us a full life. It's only people who give the devil a foothold, then they can then the, uh, the devil can steal from us, uh, from those people, and hurt them, and destroy them. And sin gives devil a foothold. Ephesians 4, 26-28 In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need now in this two ver uh, three verses in 26 is talk about in your anger do not sin so talk about do not sin do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold and then if anyone has been stealing must steal no longer and must work so that we have something to share with those in need. So in this uh, verse 26 and 28, it talks about uh, not to sin. Not to sin when you are angry. Do not sin. And then do not steal. And then in the middle, it says, do not give the devil a foothold. So it tells us that the way to give the devil a foothold is when we sin. When we sin, then we give the devil a foothold. So it's very important for us to understand that. Satan has no foothold in us if we don't sin. Now, if we sin accidentally, we ask God to forgive us. We sincerely repent that we say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've sinned. Then God is very, very happy and God will bless us and God will, will uh, forgive us and Satan has no a foothold to attack us. So it's very important. Okay, so it's very important that we understand that Satan has no foothold uh, if we don't sin. And now it's very important to discern willful sin and accidental sin. Willful sin is when we know that it's wrong to sin. If someone knows that it's wrong to uh, commit adultery, to watch pornography, to yell at people, to hurt people, uh, to attack each other, to gossip, to tell lies, to steal money. And he knows that these are all wrong and these are destructive. It's very important for us to understand that is they are destructive. And then when we sin, what happens is, uh, you know, then we give the devil a foothold and also we can lose the blessings of God. Now, even when someone sins willfully, he asks Jesus to forgive him, Jesus will forgive him. But if he sins willfully every day, he will say, tomorrow, you know, in his heart, he asks God to forgive him and then he has the intention to continue in his anger, his yelling, his stealing, his adultery, his watching pornography. If he has this intention, he's not really repenting and then he is giving the devil a foothold so we must understand that God is victory already God is a God of victory and he has given us victory over Satan he has given us dominion 
in this world so that we can claim this world this uh, I mean uh, in a spiritual way not in a physical way that we can claim the dominion that we can bless the people in this country we can bring them to Jesus Christ and bring blessings to them then we are claiming the dominion of, uh, that God gives us that we have this dominion that God wants his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven and so we will inherit the earth the meek shall inherit the earth that means we'll inherit the, the blessings of God for us to bless the world so God is all this authority already so we don't have to fear anything uh, but there are some people who just keep talking about attacking uh, being attacked by Satan and then it gives people fear Christians should not have any fear at all now we should fear sin sin is terrible we, we should fear sin so that we don't sin and if we now just now I was talking about willful sin and accidental sin if a person accidentally sin and he asked God to forgive and he say yes I Lord Lord I, I don't want to sin again he, and I want to be careful to watch myself that I don't want to sin anymore then God is very happy with him and God will forgive him now even a willful sinner when he truly repent God will forgive him and I'm but I was talking about people who sin willfully and they ask God to forgive but then they thinking tomorrow I'll sin again then there is problem whether he is uh, repenting uh, sincerely then then this person could have problem with the relationship with God so we should all say when we you know love God and follow God we don't have to fear at all we don't have to fear or worry at all God for sure will forgive us and Satan has no dominion over us at all so if God has victory and he give us that victory he give us the power over Satan and he will give us faith in him so how can we have victory over Satan <clears throat> in uh, Ephesians 6 12 on it talks about uh, the armor of God how to fight against Satan so we look at these verses now for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities it means princes or countries against powers uh, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have done all to stand so it says that we, are, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood it's not against people that we are wrestling against but against principalities now here is not talking about uh, physical countries but it's talking about the dominion of Satan the dominion against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age so it's about uh, the dark forces Satan and the demons against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places so here Paul make it very clear it's not fighting against spiritual kingdom it's fighting against uh, spiritual dominion we're not fighting against physical kingdoms but we are fighting against spiritual kingdoms spiritual dominion and the power of darkness the rulers of darkness against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places so when we are fighting against spiritual uh, beings the demons then we need to the whole armor of God therefore take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to <coughs> withstand <coughs> excuse me <coughs> that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have done all to stand so that we can withstand in the evil days against Satan and have done all to stand that we can stand for so what do we need to do stand therefore having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplates of righteousness and having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith 
with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmets of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So here it talks about the spiritual warfare. So the armor of God. So first is the waist, uh, the, uh, girded our waist with truth, that we have the truth around us to support us, to give us strength, to give us authority with the truth. And then the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate is, you know, uh, on the hearts now in the old days, the, uh, the armor, they have this breastplate so that when the enemy uh, try to shoot at them or uh, try to pierce them, the breastplate will protect them. So it's for protection. And then having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So also we put on shoes. The shoes are the gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace that we will go and preach in different places to preach the gospel. So this is, now this is fighting against Satan that we have the gospel to bring people to Christ so that we can take people out from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. So we, we have the gospel. And then 16, above all, take the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked ones. Wicked one. So here is the attack of Satan. Now both the blessed breastplate, the breastplate is for protecting against Satan's attack and against people's accusation so that people cannot accuse us because we have the righteousness of Christ that Christ has declared us righteous and also we have the righteousness of the saints of the Christians that we live a righteous life so there are two kinds of righteousness first is the righteousness of Christ given to us through the death of Jesus Christ. When we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, then we have the righteousness of God. And then we have the righteousness of our own, that we are faithful to obey God, and that is our righteousness. So then Satan cannot accuse us, and people cannot accuse us. So the breastplate is for protection against accusation. And then the shield of faith is for protecting any from any kind of fiery darts of the wicked one. Now the fiery darts could be, uh, you know, people accusing us, attacking us, uh, saying bad things about us, um, blasphemy against us, uh, or blasphemy against God, against the church, or uh, doing different things to attack the Christians. So. The fiery darts will come from Satan and from sinful people. And then we have the shield of faith. What does faith mean? Faith means I trust in God. God is protecting me. God will take care of me. So it's very important that we realize that it's, it's not with you know, physical power that we protect ourselves. It's with trusting in God that He is protecting us. God loves us so we can trust in God and relaxing God and don't worry. Now to me the definition of faith is trusting in God. That when God promises, I don't worry. I trust in Him. When God works, I don't worry. I trust in Him. So that is faith. So when we have the faith, uh, the shield of faith, that means we trust that God will protect me. God will bless me. God will help me. So I don't have to worry at all. So if anyone tried to attack me, I would just say, God will protect me. I just trust in God. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to fear. And we can trust in God's blessings. So it's very important that even in, all, in the midst of all difficulties, in sickness or any kind of difficulties, we'll say, God is protecting me. I can just relax in God. I don't have to worry. I don't have to fear. And then the helmet of salvation. Helmet. 
over the head is also protection so that they cannot take our life we have salvation so that Satan cannot take our spiritual life and our physical life that we are in the hands of God so these three are for protection the uh, first the uh, 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 girding our waist with truth that is also for strengthening for strengthening and for pr protection and then the breastplate of righteousness is for protection from accusation and then the shield of faith is for protection against attacks of Satan and people and then the helmet of salvation is for protection that Satan cannot steal our salvation that we won't lose our salvation and then the sword of the spirit is for attacking now the gospel and the shield of uh, and the uh, sword of the spirit are for attacking the gospel is for bringing people to Christ and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God so when Satan attacks us we can declare God is protecting me we declare the word of God God is my refuge no one can take the blessings of God from me God is with me all the time he is in front of me and behind me he is laying his hand upon me so we declare the word of God to protect us and to attack Satan and to also bring people into the kingdom of God to let people know God has loved you all this time God wants to give you salvation so when you trust in Jesus as your Savior you'll have eternal life so God wants you to have eternal life God wants to bless you and God for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life so God has given you this eternal life do you want to take it so we have this word of God the sword of the spirit this has the power and the Holy Spirit will work with the word of God that whenever the word of God is preached the Holy Spirit will work in the heart of people so when we hear the word of God the Holy Spirit will move us to obey him and when we preach the gospel the word of God from our mouth uh, will work on people the Holy Spirit will work with the word of God to change people's life so this is the the tool of attacking the kingdom of Satan and then also praying is also the the weapon praying always with all prayers and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints so we pray for all the saints and also prayer is building up a strong relationship with God building up the strong presence of God that we love God and worship God and God's presence will come strong upon us and then we pray for all the saints that they will be strengthened especially those who are being persecuted so we pray for them so that they won't lose the faith that God will strengthen them and give them direction and guidance so that they will follow God and have strength so we pray for all the people and we pray for the fruit of preaching the gospel we pray that God will use our preaching to bring people to, to the kingdom of God so this this is the armor of God here what we talk about here so we first we have the the truth that give us strength and give us the assurance give us a firm foundation and then we have the breastplate of righteousness to protect us from any kind of accusation from Satan and from people and the gospel for us to bring people in the kingdom of God and a shield of faith that we believe that no one can take away the blessings of God therefore we trust in God we believe in God we say God you will help me you will bless me so I trust in you that you will protect me that I don't have to fear the devil so this is the way to stop the attack of Satan but some people use other ways they will shout and shout and they will say oh a spirit of uh, uh, anger spirit of uh, adultery go away go away they think that it's by shouting or for by driving out the demons that the, the sins are taken care of now the Bible has not talked about that the Bible talks about repentance to God and say God I'm sorry for my sin so the Bible doesn't talk about crying out against the spirit of darkness and spirit of adultery and anger to drive out the sins 
And the Bible doesn't have that. The Bible has repentance to God. And the Bible has prayer toward God, not toward Satan. Now, except when we drive out demons. In Jesus' name, we cast out the demons. Except when we drive out demons in Jesus' name, then all the other prayers should be directed toward God. We find in the whole Bible, even when Peter and Paul were, pers were persecuted, they did not declare to Satan, you have no power over me. Satan, go away. They didn't pray like that at all, Peter and Paul. So the Bible does not support that kind of prayer to declare to Satan, you cannot you know, keep me in prison, you cannot do this, do that. We, we don't pray to Satan. We pray to God. We pray to God that God will protect us and God has all the authority. We don't have to declare to Satan to drive them away. We have God who will drive them away because God has victory already. So I just haven't found that kind of prayer in the Bible. But I know it's very, very common. Instead of using faith, they use shouting to drive out the demons. So we, and, and also, you know, to overcome sins, we repent. And then we uh, have a pray to God to have a strong presence of God and have the joy of the Lord and have the motivation from God that will say no to any kind of sinful thoughts. That's how we overcome sins. It's not by casting out the demons of uh, adultery. You know, it's, some people think that when you drive out the demons of adultery, then the person uh, would, you know, would not have adultery anymore, that he would have power to overcome the sins. So they think that they need to you know, shout to Satan in order to have victory. But the Bible doesn't teach that kind of prayer. When we submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee. Victory over Satan is not hard. James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God. Most important is most important to submit to God. Resist the devil. So whenever the devil tempts us, we'll resist the devil. We'll say no to the devil. Say no to the temptation. And he will flee from you. He will flee from us when we submit to God and have a strong presence of God and praise God and love God. And whenever Satan says anything, we'll say, this is not true, go away. And then we trust in Jesus. Now, when people have demons, then we drive out demons. But when it sins, then we repent to God and ask God for strength to overcome the sins. Now, Satan comes to attack, resist him with faith. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. Be sober and vi be vigilant. Therefore, because your adversary, the devil, walk about, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. <clears throat> so here, be sober. Do not be drunk, but have a clear mind. Vigilant, be watchful. Therefore, uh, because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. He's walking around trying to attack, seeking whom he may devour. And how can we resist him? We resist him steadfast in the faith. It's always trusting in God. It's God who has victory over Satan. So we, we uh, trust in God. We stead, we're steadfast in faith. And we know that God has victory over Satan. God has victory over sins. God has victory over suffering. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world, that all the people are experiencing suffering of different kinds, and then we, you know, we just resist the devil. And then we are steadfast in the faith that we don't have to be afraid of Satan or, or his attack or any kind of suffering. We know that God has total victory over all the power uh, of Satan. So, be sober and be vigilant, be clear-minded, watchful, and then resist the devil and be steadfast in the faith, that knowing that all the Christians are going through difficulties also. So we don't have to be afraid and we just trust in God and the faith. So here again, it talks about his faith, our relationship with God that helps us to overcome the power of Satan. And then when we follow the Great Commission, Jesus will stay with us. He has authority over Satan. Now, it's very important to understand that. 
Now, there are some people who say that when you um, go into mission field, there was someone who said to me like this, when you go into the mission field, when you drive out demons, Satan will attack you. Now, this is really ridiculous and against the Word of God. Now, let's read what the Bible says. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So it says here that Jesus came and, and spoke to them, to the disciples, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Jesus has all authority. He has authority over Satan. He has authority over power, any kind of power, any physical power, any spiritual power. Jesus has all the authority. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So bring them to become Christians and also followers. Disciples means learners, students. That they don't just believe. We don't just make believers. We make disciples. We help them to believe in Jesus and then we help them to follow God, to obey God. And baptizing them in the name of the Father and, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So baptizing the, the Christians and teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. So the co a Great Commission doesn't just have evangelism. It also has teaching them not just teaching them, uh, just telling them the truth, but telling them to observe, to obey all the things that Jesus has commanded us. So, not just to know the truth, but to obey the truth. Then, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So, Jesus said, I'll be with you always when you preach the gospel and when you teach people to obey to observe all the things that Jesus has taught us, then Jesus will be with us. So when Jesus is with us, He will protect us. When Jesus is with us, He will protect us against Satan, and He will guide us, He will give us strength and provision so that we can prevail, so that we can do great things with the power of God. So, so here it says that when you go and preach the gospel to the whole world, I'll be with you. Now, of course, not everyone go to the mission field, but whenever we preach the gospel uh, to the people around us, we teach them to observe everything Jesus has taught us, then God will be with us and He'll protect us. But there, was, there were people who said that, oh, when you go to the mission field, there was one person who said that to me. When you go to the mission field, so very often Satan will attack you. Th that is not biblical. That is giving Christians fear to go into the mission field. Jesus said when you go into the mission field, when you preach the gospel, I'll be with you always. When Jesus is with us, He will give us strength and protection and provision and, and also uh, success in the ministry. That Jesus with us means every blessing. So we need not fear at all. We don't need to fear at all. But some people always give people fear. They, you know, it, there are some Christians who say to other, oh, uh, someone is putting a curse on you. And then people are afraid. We don't have to be afraid of curses. In Jesus Christ, He has victory. When we have a strong relationship with God, when we love God and obey Him and, and serve Him, we, ha we don't have to fear anything at all. So I hope that we all will say, with Jesus, I don't fear anything. And any kind of teaching that will bring fear to people, we don't want to follow. Now, when people sin, they should fear. But when we repent of our sin and we really pay attention not to sin and to take care of our sins, then we don't have anything to fear. So in all these verses, it tells us not to be afraid of any of this. And then 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 talks about what is our warfare. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. 
casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So, what is our weapon? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. It's the strength in God. Our weapon is the strength in God to pull down strongholds. Strongholds, now what kind of strongholds? Arguments and every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So when people argue against God or any high things that any pride of people, when they are proud against the knowledge of God, so we will casting will cast down all these arguments and all these proud things and bring every thought into captivity to the uh, obedience of Christ. So we bring people to submit to Christ. That is the warfare. So the warfare is helping people to not to follow Satan's way, not to follow sin, not to worry, not to doubt, not to fear, but to trust in God and obey God and serve God and submit to God totally. That is the spiritual warfare. The spiritual warfare is to bring people to totally loving, you know, believing in God, loving God, obeying God and submitting to God and serving God. But some people, they uh, define spiritual warfare as that they will have meetings and shout against Satan. They will shout, Satan go away, Satan go away, and then uh, the, uh, the, like the Satan of idols, uh, of idolatry, Satan, uh, the demons of idol idolatry, the demons of, uh, of adultery, uh, the demons of idols, go away, all this go away. So they think that this is the spiritual warfare, but there is no such example in the Bible. There is no such example. You search and see if there is any description of that. Both in the Old Testament and New Testament, there is no such example. Now, if God wants to teach us something, He will give us in the Bible. He will give us the teachings in the Bible. Let me, let me tell you what one preacher I heard one time when he preached about Ephesians 6, 12 to um, 18. He said that this is the armor of God. So you put on the armor of God and then you start to do something else to fight the devil. So they think that the armor of God is not the fighting against the devil. They think that it's something else. So that's what they mean. They will put on the armor of God and then they will declare to Satan, Satan go away, go away, and they think that is a spiritual warfare. But that is not in the Bible. We don't have to be afraid of Satan at all. When we trust in God and obey God and serve God and declare the Word of God and help people to love God and submit to God and serve God and love God, we don't have to be afraid of anything. God will protect us and bless us that we don't have to worry about uh, the attacks of Satan that you know that what the preacher was saying is Ephesians 6 really doesn't talk about spiritual warfare it just talk about the preparation of the warfare you put on the armor of God and then you start to go out and do the spiritual warfare and the spiritual warfare is what he described and it is not in the Bible is to shout to Satan to go away so it's not in the Bible but some people think that that is a uh, the spiritual warfare. They think that it's by, you know, shouting the devil and uh, uh, they use the fist sometimes even, Satan go away, go away. They think that this is the way to fight against Satan. But the Bible says that no, it's when we have the truth, when we have the breastplate of righteousness, then we are protected from the accusation of Satan and people. And then the gospel, that is our weapon and a shield of faith so that Satan cannot attack us and a helmet of salvation to protect us and the sword of the Spirit is for attacking the Word of God is for attacking to preach to people to bring them to submission of God so and then pray prayer is attacking so that we can bring more people to Christ and be watchful to this end and also in 2nd Corinthians this is 
the warfare. That this is the warfare to pull, pull down the strongholds and cast down the arguments against God and all the pride of the people and, uh, and bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ so that they will submit to Christ. Okay, some faulty beliefs about spiritual warfare. Some people regard any sickness, emotional problems, interpersonal problems, family problems, and any difficulties as attacks from Satan. So they are often afraid of attacks. Now they think that all these are attacks from Satan. Now I would say if a person sins, then some of this can be attacked from Satan. But if a person loves God, he loves God, then it's not the attack from Satan, it's just the difficulties we face every day because the world is facing hunger, the world is facing wars, physical wars, the, fa the, world, the world is facing famine and, and different kinds of disasters and these are not from, you know, these this are not necessarily the spiritual attack from Satan. These are prophesied by God. It's because of the curse on the earth when Adam and Eve sinned, then the whole world was cursed and therefore it's going down more and more. It came from the curse of God and the world will go worse and worse. But we trust in God, we'll have more strength that God will give us victory in the midst of all the uh, difficulties. So. Whenever we get any problem, we get sick, don't say, oh, Satan is attacking me, attack, attacking me again. Now, what, when people talk like this, what happens is then, they, then the people will be afraid, oh, I don't know when Satan is attacking me. And then they'll say, oh, this morning, I, I remember when I woke up, I felt so tired. It must be an attack of Satan. So they, whenever they have any problem, they think, oh, it's an attack of Satan. Then they become fear for no, be fearful for no reason. We don't have to be afraid of Satan. We know that God is protecting us. He has given us authority and nothing can harm us. So we need to believe all this. And then some people think that Satan attacks those who are faithful to preach the gospel or drive out demons more often than others. So some people think that those who preach the gospel a lot and to uh, uh, drive out demons or go to the mission field and these people will be attacked by Satan more. So they say the faithful Christians will be attacked more. Now it's true that Satan will try to find way to attack the faithful Christians. They try to find ways. There are some Christians who preach faithfully, but they're not faithful in keeping the marriage in a loving way. Or they don't treat people nicely. They use harsh authority to rule the church. They might be faithful in preaching but they are preaching the law because they are harsh on people and they are not loving the people then they will give the devil a foothold the devil is looking for ways to attack preachers and all Christians but for Christians who love God and obey God Satan cannot attack we must be very clear about this don't think that because we are preachers, therefore Satan will put extra force to attack us. Now when we sin, then Satan will attack us. If, if a preacher steals money, then he can be attacked and then he can lose his uh, ministry, lose the church and lose the trust of the people. So when people sin, then we give the devil a foothold and then he can attack us. But when we love God and obey God, and then when we sin accidentally, we ask God to forgive us, and then we don't have to be afraid. And we should be careful because God, uh, Jesus said to the man who was healed of 38 years of sickness, He said, sin no more, lest the worst thing will come to you. So we don't sin because if we sin, the worst thing can come to us. That can come from the sat uh, attack of Satan. So. Satan cannot attack faithful Christians and faithful pastors. He only attacks pastors who have, uh, who have openings in their life for Satan to attack, who have uh, footholds in their life for Satan to attack. When they have anger or love for money, a love for women, and a, uh, a lack of love for their wife, 
then they will give the devil a foothold. So we don't have to be afraid. Some people say, well, you are faithful pastors, all the faithful pastors in this place, you'll be attacked by Satan. Then it will make the faithful pastors afraid. We don't have to make them afraid. We tell them, Jesus has victory over Satan. We have victory. And Jesus will protect us. Jesus will make sure those who love Him and obey Him will go higher and higher. That's what the Bible promises. The Bible promises that when we love God, our life will go higher and higher, and our, our life will go to a higher level. God will protect us and bless us. And in a faulty belief, some people think that driving out demons of adult adultery will reduce adultery problems or driving out other demons will solve sin problems. So they think that they drive out the, uh, uh, the spirit of adultery and then the adultery will go away. It's, it's not by... The Bible doesn't teach that. Now if a person has demons, then the demons should be driven away. But the Bible doesn't teach that when you drive out the spirit of the adultery, then the person will not have the adultery. To overcome adultery, the person needs to build up a strong relationship with God and trust God and worship God and love God and obey God and realize that sins are terrible, sins are destructive. And then he would not give the devil a foothold. And then, and then whenever he has any lustful thoughts, he knows that uh, that Satan can attack him. If we follow this lustful thought, then he, then he uh, say no to the sins and say, I don't want to look at that woman. I don't want to think about that woman. I want to think about God. I, I, you know, I don't have to follow my lust. And some people think that driving out demons from churches and lo localities will solve the spiritual problems. So some people think that when they, you know, uh, they drive out the demons from the church, then the church will grow strong. No. The Bible never promises that. But when we love God and help people to love God and worship God and honor God and obey God and serve God and glorify God, then the Bible promises that that will bring strength. You, you look at the early church. They worship God together. They share with each other. They love each other. They preach the gospel. And then the church grew. The Bible never said that they cast out the demons of, uh, of uh, Judaism or other religion and then they, they, or, or the demons of uh, adultery and therefore they became strong. They're not, the Bible never said that. Number five, some people think that Ephesians 6, 14 to 18 is just putting on God's armor and they think that this passage has not told us how to do spiritual warfare. And they think that spiritual... Uh, so they think that that's just putting on a warfare and then you start to fight, fight the devil by shouting at the devil. That's not from the Bible. The Bible doesn't talk about that. And spiritual warfare is wearing God's armor and then driving out a uh, demon's power. So they think that you wear the God's armor and then you drive out the demon. So they think that that is fighting the spiritual warfare. But the Bible doesn't say that. So we look at the Bible, we cannot find any Bible verse that supports that. But that is followed by many churches. You go to many churches, they will shout to the devil, go away, go away. They, they shout that and they think that that will bring revival. 